Thank you, Rob Feaster, and welcome to worship, live stream and in person from the Sanctuary of Christ Indianapolis United Methodist Church on this Midsummer Sunday. It seems like just another Sunday, maybe, a wet Sunday, but this is a very special Sunday in the life of Christ Church because we have two baptisms today. In our first worship hour, we get to baptize Natalie Nicole Efatcher. Did I get it right? Yay. And so we welcome the E. Thatcher and Peters families, and especially the Reverend Rachel Peters Wallace, an ordained elder and pastor from the Kentucky Conference of the United Methodist Church. Awesome day in this worship hour. In the next worship hour, we have the privilege of baptizing Evelyn Jackson. And if you'd like to stick around for that one, you're welcome. We'll count you twice. Our beautiful flowers on the communion table today are in remembrance of what would have been Loretta Huey's 100th birthday on July 12th. And they have been given in honor of her and in celebration of Whitney Hall's birthday, July 25th. Whitney is Loretta's granddaughter, so we're grateful for the flowers. Special music today, Hunter Case on the trumpet. It's going to be good. I've already heard it. Assisting in worship, song leaders, Cheryl Nicholson and Steve Brinkerhoff. On the keyboards, Becky Morris and Rob Feaster. Assisting in streaming, Gary Riley and Rich Kokoski. Sound, David Hanley this hour. Please now welcome our worship leader, John Rose. Good morning. <clears throat> Our reading this morning is from Psalm chapter 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol, or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, for the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your hearts, you gates, Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. The Lord is with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for the manifold blessings and comforts that you give us. We have a good life, Father, even though we have had difficult times in our, in our country, in our world, in our, in our systems, Father, teach us to be brave. Teach us to have the courage of John the Baptist. Teach us to be, to be anxious for little, that we might be like the gates of heaven, that we might open up and be brave and admit you into our lives and serve thee in a more appropriate way. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for our church leaders and our servants. We ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
please remain standing as you are able for the reading of the gospel today from Mark chapter 6. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he's Elijah, and still others claimed he's a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given the orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard that John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a dish. The king was greatly distressed. But because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a dish. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please welcome Hunter Case and his trumpet. Nicole E. Thatcher to be brought forward now, together with the Peters and the E. Thatcher families for Natalie's baptism. Once again, we welcome the Reverend Rachel Peters Wallace. She's going to get to baptize her niece. And if you'd come all over here by the font, that would be good. Jesus said, 
Let the little children come unto me and don't stop them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. And when the disciples tried to keep the little children away from Jesus, he took a child and set that child on his knee, and Jesus said, if anybody wants to enter God's kingdom, you have got to become like this little child. Uh, she, Natalie is um, beautiful, brilliant, precocious, loves to talk, but she's probably not interested in our questions. So we're going to ask Will and Amanda to answer the questions. First of all, do you renounce Satan, the author of all sin, evil, and lies? And if so, say, we do. Do you confess Jesus Christ, Savior of your life and Lord of your every day? And if so, say, we do. And do you promise to bring up Natalie Nicole under the teaching and ministry of Jesus Christ through Holy Scriptures and by example, so that day will come and it'll be coming too soon when she will stand and make her own good confession, Jesus Christ is Lord. And if so, say, with God's help we will. And you who stand as family and witnesses, do you promise to do everything in your power to encourage Natalie and nothing that would discourage her by your witness and example? And if so, say, with God's help we will. And you who are representatives of the greater congregation of faith, Christ's Holy Church, do you promise to do everything in your power to encourage Natalie and to say or do nothing that would discourage her as she looks up to all of you? And if so, say, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. Want me to pour? Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth life. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water, and after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John, anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it to wash away her sins and clothe her in righteousness that throughout her life, dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in his final victory. Natalie Nicole, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Almighty, God, Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of your daughter, Natalie, and we give you thanks for the great community that you have surrounded her with, this family, and this church. God, we just ask that you continue to pour out your grace upon her, that as you raise her up, she may become aware of your love, that you would lead her uh, in righteousness and that she may come to profess Jesus Christ as her own Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift that she is. Amen. Amen. Would you please welcome our newest sister in Christ. <laughs> children's time today? Anybody? <laughs> Guess not. That's okay. We'll move right along. 
Oh, oh, we've got, we've got some wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ethan, for coming up and bringing your cousin with you. What's his name? Logan. Welcome, Logan. That would be Logan Wallace, is that right? Yeah, we're glad you're here. Today we celebrated Natalie's baptism, right? Ethan, do you remember your baptism? No, nope. we remember it. We were all here for it. It was a wonderful day, just like today. But you might wonder, why do we do this? Why do we put water on a little girl's head or a little boy's head, and why do we say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? We do it two reasons. One, it was done to Jesus. And two, Jesus told us to do it for each other. But why do we do it? We do it so that we can say, I believe in Jesus. And if we're too little to say it, like Natalie is, our moms and dads and our grandpas and grandmas and our friends all in church say, we believe in Jesus and we're going to help Ethan and Logan grow up to believe in Jesus too by all the things we say and by all the things we do. But who baptized Jesus? His cousin, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had a real important job. He was to go ahead of Jesus and prepare the way for everybody to believe in him. And so when Jesus came to the river to be baptized, John says, no, no, Jesus, I should be baptized by you. You're the good one. And Jesus says, no, let's do this so that all righteousness is fulfilled. And so Jesus was baptized by his cousin John. Now the one thing Jesus didn't need was to confess sin. But everybody else has to confess sin. We have to admit, I'm wrong. Do you ever do anything that you get punished for? Do you sometimes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what we call sin. Yeah, it's doing wrong things, and we have to be taught not to do them. And John the Baptist came to tell everybody, stop doing wrong things, start going with God. And if you do want to do that, Stop doing wrong things, start going with God, believe in Jesus, then you can be baptized. That's so everybody knows, I believe in Jesus, I want to stop doing wrong things, I want to start doing right things. Well, let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for John the Baptist, who baptized you. Thank you, Jesus, that you called us to be baptized so everybody would know we believe in you. Amen. Thanks for being here. God bless you as you're going. And children can be released to go to praise time. Terry Hanley has that ready and waiting if anybody would like to go today. Well, these are the days that make being a pastor really exciting. When we get to welcome somebody into the family of God, formally. Baptism for us United Methodists doesn't save us, but it's the outward and visible sign of God's inward and saving grace through Jesus Christ. So it's like standing up and making a testimonial. For a little one like Natalie, it's her family making a testimonial. And all of us saying, yes, we agree. And we're going to be there with you no matter what. It's one of the most exciting days in the life of a church. For me, even more exciting than marriages. Because I don't know if they keep statistics on how many baptisms actually stick but I'll bet it's way more than the less than 50% of marriages that stick. And if we do our job, it's going to stick. It's going to mean the complete difference in Natalie's life. And even though we may not see evidence of it for a while, it's going to forever change her. Change her into a child of God 
who will be welcomed finally one of these days into God's eternal presence through Jesus and his grace. Isn't that the most exciting thing that can possibly happen in the life of a church? Maybe it's better than paying off mortgages. It's better than a successful Bible school, even though that's a wonderful thing. It's better than sending two dozen kids to church camp, even though that's exciting. This is the beginning. Baptism. And the one in Scripture who was the first one to do it was John the Baptist. And that's what we're going to talk about today, John the Baptist. Tragically, the Scripture today is, it's over for John. I know that's a kind of blunt way to put it, but his job was done. He had faithfully done what he was called to do. And now his job was over. But first, I want to talk about something that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said way back in 1966. It was June of 1966. And Dr. King was preaching at the home church in Atlanta. And this was the opening of his sermon. It was Good Friday. 1966. The church must tell men that Good Friday is as much a fact of life as Easter. Failure is as much a fact of life as success. Disappointment is as much a fact of life as fulfillment. Dr. King added that God doesn't promise that we will avoid trials and tribulations, but if you have faith in God, God has the power to give you that inner equilibrium that will get you through your pain. Now, how many of you have had pain in the last year and a half? Come on, let's be truthful. I think it's just about all of us. But God gets us through it. And King knew firsthand what that meant because King had been down in Selma the night that he got a cough or a, a telephone call while he was having a cup of coffee at his at his kitchen table and the voice on the other end of the phone said I'm going to blow your brains out Dr King was leading what became the civil rights movement it started there in Selma under his leading and that night his life was threatened his family was threatened they were going to kill him and they were going to blow up his church and they were going to kill his whole family. That's what he heard that night. And he said, that's the night when I discovered I could no longer coast on other people knowing God. I could no longer coast on my father, who was a great preacher and pastor, my mother, who was a wonderful witness. I could no longer coast on my wife's faith. I now had to come to terms with God because I had no guarantees I was going to wake up in the morning. And dear friends, that's where all of us one of these days have to be. We have to come to terms with who God is and who God is for us and who God is with us and what that's going to mean when my life is over. So who was this John the Baptist? Well, we know from Scripture, Luke chapter 1, that John the Baptist was a child of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they were old, too old to have kids. But one day, while John's father was serving as a priest in the temple, he went into the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies. He had a rope tied around his ankle so that if he got struck dead by being so close to God, they could drag him out. And an angel appeared to him and said, well, I got good news for you, John. You and your wife, Elizabeth, are going to have a baby. We're too old. She's barren. Do you question me? Well, you're going to call this baby John, and since you question me, you're not going to be able to talk until he's born, and you'd better name him John. So, 
Well, Zechariah the priest goes out of his temple duties and he can't say a word. He can just make gestures. They knew something amazing had happened in there, but nobody knew what. And then we skip to the next frame and it's Mary's got good news from the angel Gabriel. You're going to have a baby. You're only 14 years old, but you're going to have a baby. And guess what? Your cousin Elizabeth, who's way past having babies, she's going to have a baby too. And so Mary runs off to the hill countries of Galilee and as she enters her cousin Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth says, whoa, that baby just kicked a big kick. How is it that the mother of my Lord has come to visit me? Mary was already expecting baby Jesus. Elizabeth was in her sixth month with John, her baby. It was a glorious reunion for those two women. Elizabeth old, Mary young, both having babies. I mean, Elizabeth was too old to have one, and Mary's too young to have one, but they're both having babies, and it's God's idea, and it's amazing. Then we jump to the birth of John. Now he's born, and when he's being presented and dedicated and named, they motion what's going to name this baby, and Zechariah writes, John. And they think, what? Where'd that name come from? That's not family name. Why'd you name him that? I can remember when our son was born. That's what the grandpa, great-grandpa said. Why, why'd you name him that? Anybody else have that experience? Why'd you name him that? And uh, then John's mouth was open. And he gave that wonderful, wonderful praise to God. The song of Zechariah. And in it he says, And you, child, shall go before the Messiah, and you shall prepare the way. This was Elijah's prophecy, or this was the prophecy of Old Scripture that Elijah would come and prepare the way for the Messiah, now fulfilled in this infant child. We don't know much about his life. We believe that his parents died while he was young. He may have been raised out in the desert by the Qumran community where we got the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you don't think they were out in the desert, those scrolls were found in caves on the face of a cliff where you had to rappel down about 100 feet on the sheer face of the cliff. That's, that's where the Qumran community was. It was not just out in the desert. It was the inhospitable, unaccessible desert. And then John came out of the desert when he was about 30 years old and began to preach the Messiah's coming. Repent. Stop sinning. And the people were so excited by this phenomenon coming out of the desert by the Jordan River preaching and baptizing that the, they came out in droves and and you would think that a celebrity preacher like John would have been having out the, the offering baskets and maybe a few trinkets and souvenirs to sell uh, or people would have set that up but no listen to what John did he says you brood of vipers I mean preacher that's driving them away But that's what he said. He says, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Didn't stop them. They kept coming. And then finally Jesus came. And John didn't really want to baptize Jesus. But Jesus says, let's do it anyway. And that's when the Holy Spirit descended from heaven. And the voice of God was heard to say, this is my son whom I love. And I am pleased with him. And then... John had just a couple more little jobs to do. He had to point out Jesus. Behold, there goes the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world. And John the Baptist followers turned around and started following Jesus, Andrew, who went and got his brother Simon, Peter, and Philip, who went and got his friend Nathaniel. They were disciples of John the Baptist, followers of John the Baptist. So that's job one done. I got my followers and now following Jesus. And then John had to publicly proclaim, I am not who you're looking for. He is. I must decrease so he can increase. Now John's job was done. And Jesus took over. 
Jesus took over the preaching. Jesus, even, it says, and his disciples were doing some baptizing, although that was not a significant part of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus took over the crowds of people coming out from the cities and coming up from the country and following him by the hundreds and thousands. Jesus took over. John's job was pretty much done. But John felt he had one more important thing to do, and that was to point out to Herod the king just how sinful he was. You see, John's job was to call people from their sinfulness into a walk of faith desiring to know the Messiah. That's what his baptism was all about. And I think we lose sight of that in Methodism because we baptize babies. They're not sinful. I mean, I just spent the last week with my newest baby granddaughter, and there's not an ounce of that in her. John Wesley said original sin is real, but it's not a birth disease. It's not something we catch when we're born human. He said Original sin is original sin because we're so original and creative in the way we sin. And we are. And sociologists and psychologists tell us that most of the rebellion and most of the sin that becomes very, very real when your child turns about 13, um, most of that is things that we teach our children. And maybe we don't intentionally teach it, but we live in a culture and a society where so many things are so real, things like misogyny, racism, things like arrogance and superiority and thinking we're better than other people. We teach that stuff. Teaching that it's okay to be mean to somebody just because they're different. It's okay to be mean to people because we're afraid of them. We teach those things to our children. And so sin becomes full-blown, and then the promise of baptism hangs on that incredible tipping scale. Which way is it going to go? Which way is it going to go? Which way is it going to go? Until somebody comes into that child's life who convinces them that going with God is a good thing. I'm so grateful for a pastor, his wife, for a Sunday school teacher, and my grandma. For without them, I would not stand here. Somebody out here is going to have to be that pivotal person in Natalie Nicole E. Fetcher's life. And it probably won't be her mom and dad, because you know how 13-year-olds through 17-year-olds are. Mom and dad don't know anything. That's what John's job and ministry was all about. Being that one that would convince somebody, now it's time to take God seriously. Now it's time to follow God. And he was determined to convince the king of that. I mean, the audacity of this guy from the wilderness. Going to tell the king he needs to get his life together? But that's what he did. King, you've committed sin. You have married your brother's wife while your brother is still alive. I don't care if you got a civil divorce. You're committing sin and I'm sure he pointed it out to him every opportunity he had. And it made Herodias so angry. I mean, after all, Herodias was a royal princess. Herod was not royal. His father was a usurper. He was a Johnny-come-lately. He grabbed the power and ran with it. But Herodias, the wife, oh man, she was a royal princess. Her family had ruled Palestine. She had her head so far up in the air, you couldn't bring her down. And the arrogance of this preacher telling her that she and Herod were committing sin. They loved each other. What's wrong with love? Well, really, Herodias was about power. And she knew that Herod was going to be more powerful than her first husband, Herod's brother, who was called Herod the Landless One. He didn't have a country to rule, and she wanted a country to rule. And the irony of all this is that things got so bad politically for her second husband that she and he were both exiled to Gaul, so far away from Palestine and power, and she died without any note in history. But that's later. 
she wanted revenge on John the Baptist. So there came that night, a, 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 a night nobody expected to come. It was a party night. Everybody was in a good mood. And, and you know how it is when you, when you bring your child out to show them off to the company. Anybody have that happen to you? Yeah, for me it was sixth grade David. Come play the piano for everybody. Oh, I hated that. That is the night that my fingers locked up. I couldn't play a piano to save my soul. It's one of those nights my father said, how come you always embarrass me? But that's what they did. They brought the little girl out to dance for the party. And she so pleased the king, she willingly came out, she danced, that he promised to give her anything she asked for. You can have a, you can have a new Barbie caravan if you want. You, you can have the latest swimsuit. I mean, you tell me, what do you want? She runs to her mom. Mom, what do I ask for? Is this Herodias moment. She says, the head of John the Baptist. Can you imagine the shock on that little girl's face? You want what? You tell Herod, I want John's head. Now, now John's got, or Herod's got the problem. Oh, I can't embarrass my wife, my daughter, myself, my guests by refusing. I have taken an oath. I got to do it. So he sent the executioner. He did his job and brought John's head back. And the footnote to the story is his followers came and they took his body and buried it. So what does this mean to us? I mean, it's a horrible story. But what does it mean to us? Well, first of all, John's death and Jesus' deaths were very similar. John's death was an execution. It says so. He sent an executioner. It was a state decision, a government act. No different than taking somebody over to the Terre Haute Penitentiary. I mean, there wasn't all the legal process. There wasn't the $400,000 or more that it cost to get through the legal process of condemning a person in America to death, but it's no different. Back then, a king could say it, an executioner could do it. It was done. Jesus' death was the same way. Pilate gave the order. Jesus was scourged. He was nailed to a cross. The deed was done. It was a horrible, horrible horrible way to die. The importance of Jesus' death is part of our regular community experience in the Apostles' Creed, where we say he was crucified, died, and buried. It says in 2 Samuel 14, we will all surely die. So it was common to our human experience, although we have sanitized that and separated it from dying at home, surrounded by family and friends, to now dying in institutions, hospitals, nursing centers, or even the, the, uh, uh, the places where that they take care of you as you die. I can't think the hospice centers. But it was different because John's was done in private with really no witnesses. Jesus was very public with everybody telling him what a horrible person he was. Jesus' death was seen by everybody. It's common to our human experience, this execution, because we're still doing it. 53 nations, including China, India, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United States have legal executions. There were 657 of them in 20 countries in 2019. In 2020, 17 people were put to death, executed, 17 in 2020 in the United States, several of them right over here at Terre Haute. It's believed that China executes the most people in the world every year, thousands that they don't tell anybody about. But people are regularly being killed all over the world in execution-style killings. Right now, one of the centers of that is Mozambique, right next to Tanzania in uh, East Africa. 
In the last three years, over 2,000 people have been executed by ISIS-ISIL sympathizers in Mozambique, just that country. But in the United States, people haven't really died for their faith since the civil rights movement. Dr. King was one of the last people to be executed for his faith during the civil rights struggles. David Zimmerman and Nathan Stiff, who are uh, musicians and songwriters, have written, our rest is in heaven, our rest is not here. Then why should we tremble when trials draw near? Be still and remember the worst that can come, but shortens our journey and hastens us home. Christ our glory, Christ our hope, Christ our King forevermore. Be still and remember the worst that can come, but shortens our journey and hastens us home. On July 31st, we remembered John Huss, Johannes Hus. He lived in what's today Czechoslovakia. He was a monk, he was a priest, he was a devout Roman Catholic, but he began preaching, just like John the Baptist, repentance for forgiveness of sins, and he began preaching that in the 15th century when the Pope was selling forgiveness insurance. The Pope said, you don't need to repent, just buy insurance, <laughs> and we'll get your sins forgiven. And that way I can raise some money to fix things up in Rome. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous to us, but don't we have fundraising stuff? And the emperor, Holy Roman Emperor of that region, which was centered in Czechoslovakia, he was on John Huss's side because he didn't like the domination of the Pope in Rome telling him what to do. And so he supported and protected John for a long time. John said, the Bible says we all should have the cup and the bread in communion. Why are you keeping the cup from the people? The Pope said, because I said so. And John says, you cannot buy forgiveness insurance. Why are you selling it? And the Pope said, because I need to raise money. And then the Pope did an awful thing. He said to the Holy Roman Emperor, I'll give you a cut of the profit if you'll give me John Huss. And so the Emperor said to John, come to my capital. We'll have a meeting with all the church leaders. It's called the Council of Constance. I promise you safe passage. You can defend your beliefs. Nobody's going to hurt you. As soon as poor John got to the castle, they arrested him and put him in prison. He was never given an opportunity to defend himself. He was never allowed to speak from Scripture what it was he believed. All he was allowed to do was a final appeal. He said, I appeal to Jesus Christ, the only judge who is almighty and completely just into his hands. I plead my cause, not on the basis of you false witnesses and erring counsels. He was condemned to death on July 6, 1415. He was led to the stake where he was burned. He said on his way, Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I patiently endure this cruel death. I pray thee, have mercy on my enemies. His enemies, his executioners, were so determined to blot his name off the face of the earth that they gathered up his ashes and threw them in the river so nobody could collect them and revere them. But guess what? John Huss was the founder of what we now call Hussites, who were the founders of what we now call Moravians. They have a church in Hope, Indiana, who were the people that brought John and Charles Wesley to faith. And without John Huss's sacrifice, we would not be here. Or how about Maximilian Kolb? Maximilian Kolb was a preacher, uh, Roman Catholic, Franciscan monk and preacher in Nazi Germany. He was arrested and his monastery was closed because they had a radio station that talked against the Nazis and he was taken to an extermination camp and he was standing in a line with other prisoners one morning when somebody escaped and they ordered 10 prisoners to step forward and they would die because one had escaped. And one of the prisoners who was pushed forward by the guard says, no, my wife, my children. And Father Maximilian Kolb says, I'll take his place. 
you do know that's what Jesus did for us. He took our place. So Maximilian Kolb and nine others were led to a cell where they were starved, no food, no water. After two weeks, Maximilian was the only one left. He had prayed with everybody in there for the rest of their lives, and he was the only one left. They executed him by a lethal injection. And as he died, he said, the most deadly poison of our lives is indifference to other people. Well, he died. He died without indifference. He cared so much about just one other person that he was willing to give his life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, another German who gave up safety and freedom in the United States because he felt he had to go home and suffer for the church in Germany. He said, and I quote, if I don't go home and suffer with the German church, then what right will we have after the Nazis are gone to proclaim Jesus Christ? And on the April morning in 1945, just two weeks before the Americans took over the prison where he was being held, he was led to the gallows and executed. And his final words to his friends were, don't grieve for me, today my life really begins. And then there was Nate Saint, missionary to South America, 1955, he and his friends wanted to convert the Gorani people. They were the last primitive tribe in that part of the forests of South America. He flew his plane. He'd been a World War II pilot. He'd been given medals. He flew his plane and his four friends, and they went down there, and they landed on a sandbar. And within 15 minutes of landing, they were all dead. Nate Saint's killer ended up baptizing Nate Saint's son because Nate Saint's widow stayed and brought the good news of Jesus to those desperate dark people. Nate Saint said, people don't know, who don't know the Lord ask why in the world are you wasting your lives as missionaries? They forget that their lives are the same as my life. Every one of us lives a life that someday is going to be like a bubble that bursts. There will be nothing left here. Will there be any eternal significance to the fact that you have lived? And then the last, one of the very last, to die for his faith in this country, Jonathan Myrick Daniels. He was a student at Harvard, he was in theology school. He heard the call from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to come to the South and to work for freedom, and he went with other students. And on an ordinary day like today, he went to a store with some black kids to buy something, and the store owner stood at the door and said, no, you know what's are going to be in my store. And Jonathan said, you can't do that to him. And the store owner got a shotgun, and he was pointing it at one of the girls, and Jonathan stepped in front of it and took the full force of the blast. And Jonathan Myrick Daniels had written just a few days before, if my life counts for anything, it has to count for saving these lost souls that nobody cares about. Did you hear that? If my life counts for anything, it must count for saving lost souls. Nothing else matters. Paul wrote, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul wrote, we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may show up in my flesh. Let us pray. Oh, Jesus who loves us, who promises to take away our fear, Jesus, who called his disciples to go and suffer as he did. 
Jesus, who calls us to be ready to suffer for the gospel, we pray that we will have no reason to be afraid, that we may truly serve you in our flesh for the sake of all who are lost. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, Jesus, who loves us, we pray that you will guard and keep safe these whom we love, especially Sandra Brown, today at St. Francis, John Morris, Greenwood Village South, Tina Chris's son, Rusty, at St. Vincent Hospital, Amy Dupreet, Gary and Nancy Riley's daughter, now taking radiation and interferon therapy for cancer. Jenna Noble, still testing and hoping for answers. Travis Perry, Jen Land's cousin, suffering cancer with four children. Kenny Joe Brown in chronic pain. David Ganier, Dave Walsh's friend, taking cancer treatments. Jack McLean taking cancer treatments. Linda Bantha taking cancer treatments. Stephen Allen suffering with Parkinson's. Leon Mills taking cancer treatments. Diana Boyce waiting to hear what the next round of treatments will be. Jane Graff, John Bales and Libby, Claudia Banker and Bill, Marty Agresta, Gary, Jerry and Sherrod Brown. Lord, in your mercy. Well, Jesus, you promised to take away our fears as we bear witness to your life and the hope of eternal life. And so we commend especially to your care these who are getting close to the ends of their lives, Shirley Haynes, Millie Becker, Helen Lucas, Maxine Croker, all in their 90s. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus, who promises to take away our fear, to guard us and protect us, we pray for those who protect us day and night. These who serve the needs of others, especially police officers, sheriff's officers, firefighters, Jim Campbell, Tim Clark, Charles King, Mark Riley, Damon Cox, Jay Noble, and Brandon Carr. May their example of living compassion inspire us in our care for others. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, Jesus, who promises to take away our fears, we're so grateful for these who have overcome their fears and serve now in our nation's military in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, volunteering to fight for our freedom in faraway places. John Campbell, Abby and Wyatt in Alaska, Giovanni and Brittany Julian, Liam and Noah in South Carolina, Kelsey Orr, Paige and Breyer in North Carolina, Ben Morphew in Dubai, Chris Benitez in Texas, Joel Keats in Arizona, Rob Boland in Washington State. Shane Dickey in Georgia, Logan Van Blarkham in Chicago, we pray that you will guard and keep our loved ones safe. Speak into the depths of their hearts and our hearts and calm our fears. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus, you send us out to proclaim your good news, and so we have no reason to be afraid. But we know there are lots of people who don't think anybody remembers them or cares. Help us to remember nobody's name and nobody's identity is hidden from you. We pray for these who may think they are forgotten. Adam Hall, a prisoner at Newcastle State Penitentiary. Jerrica Patterson, as daily she travels from Indianapolis to Terre Haute to work with the prisoners at the Federal Penitentiary. And for our missionaries serving in far foreign places, the Wurtzes in Tanzania, Jamelin Pay Williamson, Zanli Fandwa in Haiti, Daryl and Wanda Fulp, Hope for Home in Guatemala, Mission Guatemala. We pray for those at Fletcher Place, the Indiana United Methodist Children's Home at Lebanon, Andrews Harvest, and all who are serving in our conference church camps. Gather us to yourself. Keep us faithful, remaining in you, bearing much fruit, that those who do not know you may know your name. And so we pray for all in authority over us our President Joseph Biden, our Bishop Julius Trimble, our Governor Eric Holcomb, our Mayor Joe Hogsett, our Conference Superintendent, Dr. Elise Fulbright. Lord, in your mercy. As we all join our voices praying as Jesus taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I pray that you may find some opportunity this week to bear witness to somebody. You may not know who it is. To let somebody see in you the face and the love of Jesus. And because of you, know his saving power. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you. God so graciously look upon you and fill you with all spiritual benediction and love that we may so live together in this life that in the life to come we may have it together forever with Jesus. And we all say it.